Flygon has one of my favorite Pokemon designs, but I have to admit, it can be a little bit confusing. Flygon's name, it might seem like a portmanteau of the words fly and dragon, but it's not a flying dragon type. But to me, the name is more of a rearranging of dragonfly, which it resembles. So this must mean it's a bug and dragon type, right? Well, no, it's a ground and dragon type, and it's, it's found in the desert in Gen 3. Some species of dragonflies are called sand dragons, but I say we leave this discussion here. We'll probably never see a bug and dragon type Pokemon, but grab yourself a Sodi Pop because it's time to see how Flygon performs in a Pokemon Red solo challenge. Before I dive deeper into Flygon from a statistical standpoint, the huge thing that got me excited to do another Flygon video is that it's in the medium slow leveling group. That's very unique for a dragon type, or at least it was for like two decades until Scarlet and Violet released two medium slow leveling group dragons in the same game, but it goes without saying that it's going to be pretty big for the run. Medium slow is a fantastic leveling group, and I just think it's cool because to me, slow leveling group and dragon types are just synonymous with each other. When you look at the stats this little dragonfly it doesn't have anything that's going to blow your mind but it's all 80s or 100s which is more than fine there's nothing to complain about and today's learn set is going to be modeled off of generation 8 specifically brilliant diamond shining pearl and i went with this mainly because of outrage other new moves will include bulldoze to give us an early ground move bug buzz so i can cry about flygon not actually being a bug top and dragon dance will be used because is a dragon really a dragon if it can't dance all of this combined together with that medium slow leveling group, it made this one a blast to play. So let's quickly get through the early game where there's no extra battles. I'm just gonna do the one mandatory bug catcher, but before we move on, let's talk about Outrage for a second. It's not gonna one shot this lowly little Weedle here. And this kind of runs you into that same corner that we seen on the Haxorus run a while ago. Dragon is a special type and while Outrage is incredibly strong, I'd much rather be using physical moves. But when I'm done here, I head straight to Brock. To talk more about Outrage, it's a 120 base power move that acts just like Thrash. That means you use it once, it's going to last 3-4 to four turns, and then you're going to self-inflict confusion on yourself. And there will be several times in the video where I play in such a way to where I avoid hoping for that 4 turn, because hitting yourself multiple times is a recipe just to lose time overall. And in a situation with Brock, it's going to take 4 turns if you just want to go straight Outrage. Now to remedy this, I set up Dragon Dance to be able to outspeed Onyx later, I use Bulldog once to chunk the Geodude and then I'm in a comfortable three shot range so I just select Outrage, I go on autopilot and I get the badge. Now this one isn't as straightforward as some Brock fights can be but at the end of the day it's hard to argue with a six minute 39 second Brock split which is actually faster than Mewtwo and also shout out to that medium slow leveling gear for getting us four whole levels off of this one fight. Pretty good. Speaking of Mewtwo, it's head and shoulders above all other vanilla generation 1 runs and the ultimate goal of runs like this and all the other cross gen runs are to see if they have what it takes to pass that incredibly high bar. 1 hour, 53 minutes, 35 seconds, that is what each cross gen run hopes to get and out of like 20 or so runs, only 5 have succeeded so if you want an idea of how difficult it is, that's it. Even with new moves, new tops or whatever the case may be, you might think it's super strong but 75% they just can't hang with a genetic freak and when we reference split data later, Mewtwo is going to set the pace for these runs. In Mount Moon, there's a singular extra battle that I'm going to pick up. It's the Hiker. The experience here is important as a stepping stone to keep things smooth. Outrage takes care of this. And after we finally defeat the final fossil nerd at the end, Flygon is level 17. And the course of action for today is to make a straight beeline to Misty. The cool thing about Flygon is that since Dragon Dance gives us a one stage boost to both speed and attack, there's very little that it can't handle, barring that you have a little pocket of time to set up. Here I'm going to set up two times on the Star U, and this gets us to where we need to be for Star Me. This little starfish is normally fast and hard hitting, and you would want to hold off in a lot of runs, but being able to outspeed and guarantee that two shot, it makes Misty sort of like an experience catch up mechanic in this run, rather than an actual challenge. Now remember, we are neutral to water. Water. You can see that it still hurts a lot, but we do outpace and we hit an important level 20 threshold after the battle. 
This is what the hiker was for, and there's going to be a few spare battles littered in throughout the run to hit breakpoints like this. And if you're wondering what does level 20 do, well my friend, it makes rival number 2, and more importantly the path beyond that, smooth as butter, which is very important if you want a Pokemon to have its name real high up on the tier list. The best thing that level 20 does is it makes Outrage a guaranteed one shot on the usually troublesome Pidgeotto, and that means even though Flygon has his goggles on to protect it from sand, it doesn't even need them. I cruised through this fight on Outrage's back, but let me just say that this is a situation where it could get a little risky. Now remember, Thrash's effect lasts three or four turns. Let's say that it only lasted three turns. Maybe I get confused on the Squirtle. Maybe I hurt myself two times in a row. Maybe I get a bubble crit or something silly. It could waste a lot of time in the best case scenario, or it could threaten a reset as the fights get tougher, but we do pick up this win. So to keep on that subject, one of Flygon's weakness is that it doesn't really have an answer for flying type Pokemon. Mega Punch is available, but it just made the run a little bit slower, but I handled everything well so I didn't need it. Now remember, Nugget Bridge has the most mandatory trainers in the game, the highest cluster. There's also going to be several flyers here, but Outrage just takes care of it. I think Outrage as well as Thrash, they're pretty underrated in solo runs in general. Now while it might look like a nuke that has only has 10 power points, remember in a fight like Rival Number 2, I took out 4 whole Pokemon with a single power point. On average, you're going to be setting up battles to be closed out with Outrage when an opponent has like three Pokemon left. So the true value of this move is more like 30 PP or even 40 PP in some cases. Also, if anyone ever wondered why I don't just like re-examine the learn sets or maybe find something that can help solve problems, the answer is I just, I don't play like that. My thought process for runs like this is that I find something that I think is interesting. I find a learn set and then I build the assembly, I build the Pokemon first. 99% of the time I stick with that and I route the Pokemon just like I would do with any other the run. I think personally, when you start recreating ROMs to solve problems, it takes away with it takes away how I want to play Pokemon at the end of the day. The joy of starting from square one, doing a blind run, then problem solving from there until you get to the optimized runs. I think all of that would just lose a lot of meaning if you did that. That's just my opinion on it. But things are smooth here, and at the end of the route, I try something a little different. I pick up the hidden ether, and I'm just gonna use it on outrage just to bypass healing when I'm done here. Now I can't say that this saved any significant time, but it felt fast, and that's really what matters, I guess. Outside of that, look at our current time. Being here at 26 minutes, and not only be done with Nugget Bridge, but already have Misty's badge is pretty quick. So Flygon is definitely kind of hanging around with the elite runs at the moment. Down on the SSN, we could get Body Slam, but I'm not going to. The flyers that we have to worry about, they're few and far between, and with things like Rock Slide coming up in the future, this is just a natural cut just to save some time that's not really going to affect the difficulty at all. Now, we'll be grabbing the Rare Candy as well, and I'll go into this more later, but this was honestly, it was one of the most disappointing things about this run. When you look at things like Alolan Raichu, Alolan Ninetales at the top of the leaderboards, I could just cut things like this out, and I was really hoping that Flygon in a faster leveling group could truly push the limits of a solo run, but the reality is that it can't, and I'll just I'll leave that thought there for now. Rival number three is almost a mirror image of the second rival fight. I need to go outrage first once again, and I still get the one shot. But here's gonna be an example of it not being perfect. It lasts three turns, and since Kadabra has high special, it doesn't one shot. Now, I don't see any drawback. I just hit my moves through the confusion, but I have to play devil's advocate here and say, you know, what if I hurt myself? Maybe the Kadabra crit me back, and I just wanna point these things out to kinda articulate the thought process of the run. As for Surge, red version Raichu, it can't even do damage to a ground top, so there's not much use really talking about this battle. But instead, we can do the usual look at split data after the third gym. Now first, I want you to notice how I'm going to go into my inventory here, and I'm just going to straight up delete Thunderbolt out of my bags. Now this is some, I guess, next level foresight and item management since I planned the runs out. And in this run specifically, I don't plan on picking up anything extra or buying vitamins. Now at a certain point in the game, I'm going to have exactly one extra item, and this is the fastest part where I could just get rid of something real quick. Cool, I guess. As for split data, you see Mewtwo on the far right. That's the bar we're going for. Now, this one is close. I'm eight seconds behind early in the run, but being on pace, keeping things close is very positive. It's a good position to be in. Remember Misty splits, if you're wondering why the timer's so different, they're a little bit misleading, Misty splits at 
least, because a Pokemon like Mewtwo, it loves to go ahead and get the experience from Nugget Bridge, while something like Flygon, it had the tools just to tackle Misty immediately. And remember, we're not gonna look at splits until, again, until we're going into the Elite Four. The order of gems, the path a Pokemon can take, they just vary too much. And like I always say, the first three splits and the final three splits, they'll really tell you the most, but let's not dilly-dally too long. But before we make that usual little jump cut to Celadon, I need to talk about something real quick. I said this earlier, but I make the Pokemon up before I even play the run. So initially, I put Bug Buzz in here just for the laughs. I thought it would be cool maybe for psychic types, but since they are usually frail anyway, it's nothing that Bulldoze or Earthquake can't handle, so I didn't use it at all. But this is the final optimization here, and you can see in the fight against the Rapping Junior Trainer, I'm gonna learn it. As it turns out, there's a lot of things post Lieutenant Surge up to that Celadon area where it was really useful, and if you don't believe me, brother, just look down at that effective power. That's 360, and that's pretty impressive. Moving forward, Bug Buzz is something that still has some uses here you can use it on the slow pokes in rock tunnel and then after that just double super effective on things like the oddish and bulbasaur trainer but let's be real the uses that i went over right now they're more of a novelty they don't really affect the run too much so we'll come back to it now let's get to Celadon, and as usual, the Rocket Hideout is up first. The thing to note here, the one thing you need to know, is that I'm not picking up high money items. It's a very streamlined and overall uninteresting process to where I don't even need to really go over anything. So instead, let's skip over to that Celadon buy, and I really only want to show this because of how minimalistic it is. I buy my Super Repel, swap them with my Leftover Repel, and that's it. There's no selling, there's no organization needed, and on the top floor, I do pick up Rock Slide, but I'm not going to learn it just yet. I'm not going to be learning vitamins for the run, and I probably stopped saying this one day, but vitamins, guys, vitamins. They're just not useful on good Pokemon. If you don't need speed, you're probably just wasting your time. But also let me say that you need to evaluate that on a per run basis. For the next part of the run, I have to lay down the foundation, the groundwork here. I'm gonna be heading towards Erica, and in my old route, Sleep Powder and even like a neutral Razor Leaf, they were a menace. And it got to the point to where I didn't trust the fight, and I was putting this fight off late into the run. It was my sixth gym fight, and missing that little bit of experience here was kind of causing like a ripple effect in the run to where I felt like, you know, maybe an extra level would have helped on Koga, or maybe in some other spots. And once you get to that point, you're adding in extra battles to maybe compensate for that missing experience. The time starts to shoot up, but let's just hop into Erica, and there's only really one thing to say about it. Bug Buzz. It's double super effective on the hardest parts of the battle. Now being able to cross this gem off the list even before Pokemon Tower was so huge for making this run feel cohesive and fast. And I absolutely love that a move that I had no intention of using turned out to be a pretty huge optimization. Now there'll be more optimization talk later in the run. Don't forget about Erica, but if you haven't bug buzzed a Victory Bell in Generation 1, I would I'd highly recommend it. Next up is Pokemon Tower, and Bug Buzz's moment it, in the spotlight, it's over. It's dead, it's gone. And that's just how life goes. A uh, cruel reminder. Remember, everyone, you were only tolerated as long as you're useful, and when you are not, you are just discarded into the trash. Rock Slide is our new toy, and for something like the rival battles at least, it eliminates our need to open up with Outrage, which means I can manage the drawback a lot better. And that's really about all there is to say about this part. I think we can move on. Next up, I'm gonna start making my way down to Fuchsia, but first I am gonna catch the Snorlax for this run. Very important, I don't do it every single run, but Flygon needs a slightly alternate route. I'm also gonna be picking up the very first Biker on Cycling Road. He has two Pokemon, they are two one-shots. I need just a little bit of experience here, and this is where I decided to get it. I felt like this was the quickest. After that, I just zipped through the Safari Zone. Nothing really interesting here. And now I think we can just take a look at Uncle Koga. Despite the excellent top matchup and ground moves, this one, it's not so simple. You need one dragon dance for ranges, but that opens you up to a smoke screen, and guess what? I get my accuracy lowered instantly. So now we have to do the fight with 66% accuracy on Bulldoze. You can see on the move selection of the overlay, but it's not too bad. I miss once, I end up hitting the rest of my moves, but one setup isn't enough for a one shot on the Weezing, but you guys know I love my turn economy, and one setup gives you the fastest potential battle. This means I do heavy damage on turn one, but a self-destruct 
truck takes me all the way down to just 18 HP, but the important thing here is I survive and I get the badge. That's going to take us to a brisk swim down to Cinnabar, and what I like about the mid-game of Gen 1 Pokemon is just the options and the different ways to tackle things depending on the Pokemon. Being a ground type that resists fire means Blaine is an easy matchup and I can just push off things like rival number 5 until later without losing time in the long run, but being here below level 42 in Pokemon Red means that I open myself up to wild encounters and you're going to see that I get a few in the basement of Pokemon Mansion. It's not ideal, but for reasons I'll reveal later, I just can't afford to use any extra candies or do any extra training so it's just something you have to deal with and i'm also going to take a second to talk about the front sprite for flygon the unfortunate reality is that i spend probably too much time on most of my sprites but you only see them for like half a second when you pick your pokemon at the start of the video and then at the end when i'm showing the the tier list it's blurry in the background so i think i need to find some time in the videos to show off the sprite because it's pretty cool to me and maybe i could just show the actual sprite at the start and that'd be a way to not take up any extra time in the video or maybe I pick a point halfway in the video, but you just never get to see the front spot and it bothers me. Honestly, I could just have like a white blob and just edit past the reveal in the opening section and no one would ever know, but I don't want to be lazy. So before I ramble, what do you guys think of this Flygon's front sprite? I wanted to use red and green. So this is a Pokemon that definitely needed three colors or two shades of green, but I will say I do like it. It has a little charm to it. And I don't know about you guys, but after all that sprite talk, I'm ready to contemplate what TM28 actually is. Could it be Doomstoner, brother? Or something else entirely. The world may never know. As for Blaine, it's really simple. That's the reason we went this route. Two setups early. We'll give Bulldoze the guaranteed one-shot ranges of all the Pokemon with no retaliation. And just like that, we can just move on. Silph is next, there's no extra battles here, and like I alluded to earlier with the SS and Rare Candy, I need to go to the 10th floor to get this Rare Candy as well. Something that's absolutely pivotal to the run was the TM for Earthquake. Now I'm not going to learn it, and it seems counterintuitive since it's going to be easily our best move in the game, but we do learn it naturally at level 44, and this little change kind of seems weird now, but you got to stick with me because this decision is ultimately what saved this run, but enough of that, let's hop into rival number 5. Let's take it from the top, we need a setup here. The worst case scenario is Sand Attack, but unlike Koga, we do get to keep our accuracy intact and one boosted Rock Slide does the job. Growlithe is next, I do need one setup just to get myself ready for the latter half of the fight, or at least that was kind of the plan. I talk about turn economy a good bit, but two, I think two total setups here was the fastest possible battle, but Growlithe used Leer, so I call an audible and I set up one additional time. Now this makes the rest of the fight trivial, and while Blastoise at the end isn't a one shot, and yes, if you're wondering, Earthquake would make this fight a little faster, but I can't state enough how important it was to hold off on that and I promise I'll go into it more later, but this one wasn't too bad, and pretty much the only lose condition was bad luck on Sand Attack. Next up is Sabrina, and I like the way this fight was set up. You don't need to use Dragon Dance, you can just go straight Bulldoze. Now in a perfect world you would learn Earthquake right after Kadabra, but the only thing that not having it here does is make it take an extra turn on Mr. Mime. But you're going to hit level 44 after that, and Earthquake can just sweep through the Venomoth, the Alakazam. It's a pretty easy badge. I truck it over to Giovanni directly after with no extra battles, and once again, very simple battle. You set up once on the Rhyhorn, and from there you can just sweep the entire team by going straight Earthquake. I don't really think it gets more straightforward than this, and it puts like a nicely wrapped little bow on the gym portion of the game. Flygon is on a mission, so it's straight to rival number 6. Now this one is better than rival number 5, because there's no sand attack, and I'm just going to use one setup here, and now we do have access to Earthquake. This means that there's only two Pokemon on this team that are not going to be one-shots, but if things go your way, this will be overall a little bit quicker. The main point of contention for this fight was Execute, but it doesn't have Sleep Powder, it doesn't have Hypnosis at this point. Now my plan was that if I got unlucky, and maybe it's good AI, hit the 33% chance to use Stun Spore, I could just use Dragon dance and that speed increase would counter the speed drop from paralysis but it was a calculated risk i don't get paralyzed and even though it does take an extra turn on a couple of the pokemon it was pretty clean 
Now we have to go over some things. We have to talk about some stuff. But first, how about some of that juicy split data? Beating Giovanni at one hour and 34 minutes and ultimately crossing over into the Elite Four at 142 will give Flygon a little over a three minute lead over Mewtwo's time. And I know what you're thinking. This one looks like a lot to beat Mewtwo's time. And not only that, the three minute lead does gives you, it gives you some slight hope for like a top three or even like a top two time. And I was very excited, but there's an elephant in a room and we have to address it now. Some of you might have guessed what's coming and maybe have had it on your mind for the whole video, but I'm dragging in ground top. Very cool topping, but it's double weak to ice and we have Lorelai up first in the Elite Four. And let me just tell you guys that this fight is a pretty wild ride throughout the whole routing process. I think to make this one just straightforward, just go straight damage with a typical strategy, level 63 or even level 65 would be required, but for most of my routes, I was just eating the resets and just trying to brute force my way through the fight at level 60. For everything that this run has excelled at, this is where there's going to be a hard wall, but you guys know that this is the optimized run, and you know that your third favorite gym leader has a trick up his sleeve. In Victory Road, there's no extra training, and I'm not even going to get that extra rare candy, and that seems pretty crazy, but there's a few things that I foreshadowed in the video that I didn't want to spoil, and I have to say, I think that this is going to be my favorite strategy that I've ever came up with to overcome a challenge without costing me any extra time. It actually saved me time. So first of all, let me say this. My Elite Four start split and the three minute lead against Mewtwo is a little bit misleading because I crossed into the Elite Four threshold before I used my candies, but we did hit level 48 at the end of Rival 6 and that's going to give me the target level of 58 for this fight. Now for the spicy part, and it's so spicy that it's not even on my overlay because I never thought that this move would be actually useful. It's Mega Drain. Flygon can learn things like Giga Drain, so I just added it in and I'm actually going to replace Earthquake and it's a strategy that just feels so wrong. It feels so unintuitive that it hurts. But you guys just have to sit back. You have to put your faith and your trust in me. So let's just fade to black and let's see how it goes. In a perfect world, I would love to abuse Dugong's turn 2 AI, but in Pokemon Red, there's about a 30% less chance than there would be in Yellow, and it's not reliable. So I set up here, I tank a ton of damage, and then I go for Mega Drain, hoping that it'll, it'll use Rest. It uses Growl, it misses, that's fine. But at this point, I just have to go ahead and take it out. I can't risk taking another Ice move. And I was pretty sure that this was gonna be a reset. Now on Cloyster, good AI, it sees Water and Ice moves as a good choice for our typing and clan is the best option here and that's what we're gonna see but it is really important for you guys to know that with a turn one mega drain I actually have enough help to survive an Aurora beam now it'd be close don't get me wrong but this allows me to take out the cloister and now we're on to the slow bro now here's where the fight's gonna relax a lot water gun is the only thing I have to worry about and it's not even that bad and I can just set up to where I need to be to one shot the final few Pokemon now there is a lot at the end of the tunnel now slow bro is tanky it has a withdrawal setup so it takes a few hits to get down but after that it's just a matter of if I hit the 90% accuracy on the rock slide I do and Flygon against all odds under leveled has achieved a first try victory against an ice trainer and this made me really happy let me reiterate that this was a stroke of genius and it has to be said that the fight could have gone much better we could have got that early rest and all that kind of stuff but we still got it done but I do keep Mega Drain to save me a heal and it's on a Bruno I'll be real with you guys and say that I was kind of like adrenaline fueled at this point and I should have learned Earthquake from the TM and Sylph but Mega Drain it does get my health back it made a lot of sense in the moment it's great for the Onyxes it pretty much makes them a living hyper potion but it's not so great on Hitmonchan I do lose like a turn or two here and outrage only lasts for three turns but I do ignore the confusion and we just we get through this one does next and Earthquake is back on the set as expected. Now I, I did refine this route a little bit. I was originally using Dragon Dance to hit some ranges just so I can guarantee all the one shots but Golbat used Haze a lot and wasted my time on several runs so I just go for straight damage. I get a retroactive potion so it makes it the right choice here and I just I mow everything down and now we can look at Lance. Here, good AI is weird. We've already touched on it with the Cloister. Just like that, Gyarados will go for either Hydro Pump or Dragon Rage. Dragon Rage is preferred because a Hydro Crit will do a ton of damage, 
but two setups into a rock slide, that's what's needed here. And remember, Outrage, it's three to four turns, and he has four Pokemon left. And at this point, just to play it safe, I use Earthquake for the guaranteed one taps on the Dragonairs. And I leveled up, so on the Aerodactyl, I need one additional Dragon Dance, because that tiny little special badge boost, it'll put Dragonite into a guaranteed one-shot range. And with two Pokemon left, Outrage can just take us to victory. And you know what that means, there's only one battle left. Let's keep things real simple here. All you need to know is that two setups is all I need, and at this point, I can rock slide and march my way pretty much to victory. The next few Pokemon after Pidgeot, including Alakazam, are just easy one-shots, and there's nothing even slightly to worry about for a while, but just like the Execute earlier, I had to make a slight concession on Executor. It's really tanky, and it's gonna be a two-shot unless you waste like four extra turns setting up, so I just, I let the chips fall where they lay. If it goes for Hypnosis, so be it, but it does it, and that means the second slide can pick up the knockout. And at the end, Blastoise does have Blizzard, but once again, the AIC's water is the same priority level, so it misses a Hydro Pump anyway, and Flygon, it finishes off the run. This leaves Flygon with a final time of 1 hour, 53 minutes, and 47 seconds, and sadly, it did not beat the Mewtwo bar, but guys, I have a confession. This was only my second run with Flygon, and I usually do three or so runs, and I just thought that I would never be able to replicate a run this good, especially resetless, but I did dive back in. So I didn't make any major shakeups. We don't even really have to go over the route that much, but the main thing that saved me a lot of time was cutting out about two or three healing spots in the game. While I was editing the footage down for the video, I just noticed there were several spots where I was just healing for no reason, and that's really where my biggest time saves came from. Now the rest was just slightly better movement, being more careful, and just overall being more familiar with the route as you play it more and more, so I saved a lot of time here. The biggest time save in terms of like a battle was Bruno. I did learn Earthquake after Lorelei here, I do set up some Dragon Dances, and while it may kind of look like the same number of turns as the last run, setting up on the first Pokemon doesn't let any of the enemy Pokemon get a turn, so it was a little bit neater and slightly faster. The Champion Bot does end the same, and you can see here that Flygon improved. I actually was able to improve this run by just a little bit under 2 minutes. We have 1 hour, 52 minutes, and 2 seconds, and my friends, that indeed does pass the Mewtwo bar, and it actually, it puts it in 4th place over over things like Reggie Gigas and Slacking to take over that number four spot. Now sadly, Flygon is a mere eight seconds away from tying that third place spot, but those eight seconds, they seem a lot years away. Now overall, I did this run two more times outside of the optimized run. I had some bad luck on Lorelei in my third attempt, so I went back again. And after just chipping away at it, restarting a few times, I think I squeezed everything out of Flygon that I possibly could. Now if you're wondering, on Reggie Gigas, at the very end, I made a slight mistake on the final blast toys and it did cost me about 10 seconds. And there's some comments that was like, hey, that could have beaten Shadow Lugia, but I adamantly disagree. I did calculate that time into the equation. But even with those time corrections, I think I played that run about as good as I could. But with Flygon specifically, I do think there was a lot left on the table, which is, I, I'm proven right. Look at this time, it's pretty amazing. So Flygon finishes with a tier card rating of 100.9, and that means there's no change at the top. But this medium slow dragon gave it its best shot. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. There's a little theme here. Three of the four top spots in the cross gen tier list they are not legendary pokemon now something without the slow leveling group holding it back with the right coverage i think that's what makes for the best runs i think it's really cool to see some of these pokemon you might not expect especially alola nine tails that run was masterful special shout out to my channel members and patreons the support means a lot and remember if you look on the members community tab or the patreon i do release patch files for these runs and even if you are just a new viewer i do appreciate the support just the same even just viewing the video makes it it means a lot to me. Now, if you made it this far, you're a real one. Comment that down below. That also means a lot to me. And I'm, I guess I'll start thinking about the next video. Bye.